Welcome to the Itnig podcast. Uh, it's the podcast where we discuss technology and startups and invite some of the smartest people in, in Barcelona to, to share their insights. Uh, the topic of today is to demystify the product manager role and, and how to become one. Uh, and to discuss, we've invited three people with extensive product management knowledge. First, uh, Jordi Romero, uh, you're currently the CEO and founder of Factorial, uh, but also have experience from other SaaS companies like Teambox and Redbooth. So welcome. Thank you, Sindre. Uh, the second one we have is Itamar Gilead. Uh, you uh, you have been a uh, department manager at Google for six years, and before that you also you also worked in in several other uh, companies uh, yeah. around. Yeah, it's uh, I've been last six years in in uh, Google mostly on Gmail, right? A bit of YouTube as well. Yeah. Before that, I was in Israel. I working in startups, working in big companies. I worked for Microsoft for a while as a product manager. Uh, but originally as an engineer. But now you're in Barcelona. Yes, I'm very happy. It's a, uh, I'm very excited about being here. Great. And 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 uh, the last person we have uh, is uh, is uh, Roger De Bagno. You're the f- founder and, and CEO of Kipu, uh, a SaaS uh, accounting SaaS, and you're currently the CEO and the product manager. Uh, so you have a special role. So yes. w- w- welcome to you as well. <laughs> Thank you. <It's> a pleasure. <laughs> So uh, to get us started, um, I, I was I was wondering because uh, I've, I've been studying the product manager role over the last six months, and and I've been trying to is is there a definition? Is there is there a true definition? A, a one sentence definition to define the product product manager role? What do you think, Itama? Um There's no one definition. Every company has a slightly different variation of it. Since we had Agile, we added also product owner. Um, the definition that I like the most today, honestly, of all the many things that product managers are expected to do, is the person that is kind of becoming the expert on the users, the customers, the, the ecosystem, the, the competition, and that manages to deliver this context to the team that is building the product, the designers, the engineers, etc., and manages to help them build a really good solution, and eventually also manages to help launch this product, track this performance. It's a superman, basically. But the customer emphasis and the expertise are really, for me, the core, core uh, product manager skill. Right. And, I mean, uh, like customer-centric companies have, have been around for a while, but especially with the emerging, emerging tech companies the last 10, 20 years, I mean, the customer-centric companies has, has really grown. And, and has the product manager role also grown in popularity and, and usage? I mean, we hear the term product manager much more today than we did maybe 10 years ago. Absolutely. I think uh, the first time I heard of product managers was in the 90s. It was a novelty back then. Um, and it's kind of evolved over the years. Uh, back then, we were kind of product-centric. We thought that our engineering wizardry and uh, later also the product managers, we will just overwhelm the world by, by ingenuity. And I think later we started realizing that it's not so much about us, it's more about the customers. So I think the product role changed more in that direction over the years. Uh, now, I think a lot of companies are aware of product management, but I'm not sure a lot of companies have a very, very modern perception of what it is. Some companies still think it's just the person you give the instructions to and that person generates a spec based on your insight. Right, right. I, I think uh, one thing you said may, made me remember a lot of fights we had at my previous company because we defined ourselves as a product company mm-hmm. and whatever that means, right? So it basically meant back then engineering first company. And then the CEO was saying, no, we're a sales-driven company because we care about the customers. So at the end, we were fighting to say we're a product company, a sales-driven company, or a customer-first company. And I think it turns out that product company means like a product to serve our customers. And then the product team is just there to represent the customers inside the company. So that's it's kind of a messy terminology, I think, uh, especially with wherever startups and mm. kind of companies that change roles and, and definitions of, of parts of the business often. But I think that's something that we still need to properly define, I guess. Right. How, no. how, how do you define it? Yeah, for me, the product manager is like the CEO of the product, no? and this implies to have a broader vision of the business, uh, of the vision, 
uh, of it. And basically, the thing is that uh, for me, the changes that, that, that come lately is basically because one of the major uh, competitive advantage of any startup is the, the, the product that is building for technology or for uh, building a disruptive uh, value proposition to the market. So basically, this is not just about building a nice, uh, with a great user experience product and with mm -hmm. a, the last technology in the market. It's about being able to serve problems to your customers. So finally, uh, the product that you're building, it has to have a, an imp a real impact to the market. So uh, although you can define yourself as a sales driven company, probably if you are building a disruptive product, it's not that simple. I mean, if you are able to solve that problem properly, then you will be able to build a, a, a sales driven company, which is something that you have to have if you want to scale properly. But from the very beginning, uh, when I understand a product centric company, something that it's you're building something different, something disruptive. So you have to uh, build your own competitive uh, competitive advantage uh, on it. No? Mm. So that's why for me in, in our my experience which is quite short uh, being a, a product CEO um, is, is for me it's quite easy to have this broad vision of the company because it's my job no and mm. then uh, for me what it's important is to build proper uh, processes uh, into the company when you once you scale then it, it's important to, to transmit all this knowledge and these uh, best practices cultural issues uh, to, to the future right. product manager no? and but you, you are in a situation that a lot of startup are, I guess where where you can't hire a dedicated product person like you can at Google or big you know corporations uh, and you have to take take care of both the you know the leading the vision of the CEO but also the, the product development I mean how, how do you manage both both those roles and and what, what do you prioritize well I, I think it, it it have to one thing is be able to to to, to deliver to the market uh, our vision through product. This is one of the, the main things that we have to fight uh, with, and this implies to being able to to inform uh, and, and your team what are those goals and everything we are dealing uh, into the product is, is to serve a vision, which in our case is to automatize administrative processes. No, mm -hmm. So everything we are doing should be on that way, and people should understand that. And then... Um, the other thing that we have to face uh, is the is more the, the operational part, which is quite complicated for me to to be uh, on the daily monitoring of of, of our processes. So, what we have done in Kipu is to empower our our team. Mm. Uh, so, for example, uh, implementing a Scrum uh, methodologies, but not led by me directly. I'm the one who takes the decision, but the, in the operational t uh, terms, the development team helps with it. So. Uh, what I've done progressively is to empower my team so that we can deal with operational issues, which is uh, helps uh, make the business go by day, day on a daily right, basis. Right. No? Okay. Yeah. I think that's... Uh Sorry, I don't know if we're still no. in the same question yeah, or not. Please, please. But uh, what you just said, and you mentioned also in Scrum and Agile, the role of a product owner. <clears throat> a mistake I've seen uh, very often in the past is product managers become managers of the product team, mm -hmm. which is, I guess, not what they are intended to do. So they end up doing the project management of the team. So they end up, uh, you know, um, ordering the daily the daily work of an engineering team, a design team, and so on. And then they, by default, create this hierarchy where they are, you know, on one layer and then the executors are on a different layer. And I think this breaks the communication, the, you know, the, the circle of feedback and, um, I don't know, like the collaborative environment that is needed to, to ship product fast as, as any company or startup would like to do uh, in general. So I think... Agile tried to rename it as product owner, I think to, re to remove the management side of things. Mm. I don't know that that fixes anything. I think it's more an organizational issue and not so much, not so much naming. But product managers should, in my opinion, should not be managing uh, the product team that's executing that. I've heard a term several times over the last weeks that like, the product managers, they have responsibility but not authority. Uh, what do you think of that? Do you have led product yeah, teams? That's always the case. Like, uh, I think uh, you know, it's maybe in a privileged position, you're the CEO and product manager, which is probably the right thing to do in a startup in the initial phases, because honestly, you don't need the product manager on day one, or even when the team is 20, it's still very much... I think the product management function can be and should be owned by the, the entrepreneurs. Um, it's, and it's kind of like how much time you, you're willing to devote to actual product management versus mm. fundraising and, and all this stuff. And also 
how how confident you feel with the product management, but it's fine. Um, <clears throat> back to to your question. Right. Uh, the normal situation is that the product manager is someone that is kind of inserted into the team, usually the engineering team, the design team. He works very closely with marketing, with sales, with the business uh, units as well, and with customer support. But that person doesn't manage any of those uh, uh, groups. And um, <clears throat> what we accomplish, we accomplish through partnership, through influence, through, through all the soft skills that are very important to product managers so for communicating a vision through back and forth discussions through gathering data business data and yeah. uh, making this the data decision uh, data driven decisions through user research through all of these tools we managed to get everyone into a good place which is not necessarily our vision like mm -hmm. sometimes product managers lead the product where the vision comes from someone else mm -hmm. It's better if the product manager is also the visioner, but it's not always the case. Um, I think the discussion we had just before, sales-driven, product-driven, I've seen companies where it's uh, design-driven, it's more modern, mm. uh, it's very typical. Mm. And all of these things are good, if you, but if you overdo them, if you overemphasize the business side, overemphasize the engineering side, you tend to get distracted from mm. the main thing. And the main thing is the value you deliver to users, the value you can capture from the market and the value you give to the employees at the end of the day because the employees also need to, to really benefit from uh, working. And I think the product manager is in a unique position to combine these three and kind of find this win-win-win solution where you deliver value, capture value and do all of these things. Hmm. For the CEO, it's sometimes hard because you're very much pro uh, pressed to deliver numbers, to make money, to, to, to raise funds. You were, mm. Sometimes CEOs have seen being pushed to the business side much more. Right. And like in your opinion, just to, to answer this, do you, is there like a fixed answer for when a startup should hire a product manager? I think uh, once you start seeing a lot of... Um, you spend a lot of time in discussions about what the engineering needs to do mm. and, and you start seeing friction between the business size and the, which you as a founder don't have enough cycles to control. That's usually a sign that you need someone. Mm. Or if engineering comes to you and says, we, we just don't know what to do. Like mm. We talk with you sporadically, you, you give us guidance, but we really need someone to work with us day to day. That's the time to, to actually hire a product manager and not necessarily a VP of product, someone with mm. 10 years experience. Sometimes mid-level PM or even a junior can do a tremendous thing for a small company. I also think you can promote from within. Um, yeah. I, mm. I was reflecting on how we're doing it now at Factorial, so right. we're a very small team, we're seven people right now. Mm. And uh, I think we have three people doing a product role, right? All right. And I was thinking about you know what areas of product um, I think influence the company, and there is a business side of things. I mm. think there's a technology side of things, and there is a design or UX side of things, right? So if you combine the three of them, then the company flourishes. And actually, the CTO uh, would be somehow product manager, and he's obviously mm, engineering mm. oriented. Then our designer whose official title is product designer so he's leading the UX and the user's perspective mm. and then myself as a CEO as well kind of influence the product with the business perspective in mind so right. in, I think in our case we have like one product manager with three heads mm. so the three of us meet often and we discuss together and then mm maybe the product designer Cesar actually executes mm. as product manager and you know like works on specs and then negotiates with the rest of the team and makes sure that what we're doing is the right thing for the business and so on mm. but he consults often on me or on Pau for instance for the two areas where he's not so much experienced right. yet and it makes sense I mean uh, and that, that's always you know surprised me with the product manager role that you have to combine all this knowledge uh, into one position you know with three different as you say like you focus on what you know best you focus on business and your CTO focus on the technical stuff but I mean uh, if you're setting out to become a product manager I mean what kind of skills should you inherit what is your opinion Jordi? So I think these three areas and, and I've seen all of them <coughs> Well, I, I think you should know enough about these three areas. And for instance, I've, I've managed product managers and I did product management in the past and I always lacked UX. Mm. I, I don't have any training or any knowledge around user experience and I always felt you know, like I couldn't deliver a good product because mm. I, I lacked it. So I had to collaborate with a designer and it, it wasn't the same. Um, so I think you know, product managers often come from either MBAs 
mm. or engineering backgrounds yeah. or design backgrounds, at least the ones I met. Mm. Either started from, from one of, the, of those three sources. Mm. I don't know which one is the best. I think yeah. that's going to be a long debate, but yeah. I've seen good, good in neither of them. Yeah. Um, when you at least have two of them very strong in the DNA of a person, then yeah. I think you're onto something. What, what do you think? I mean, you've been dedicated to product for a long time. Yeah, and I've been interviewing a lot of product managers and hiring right. product managers. So uh, I think it's beyond... Th there's two levels. There's the education, like where this person comes from, what their education is. Where companies like Microsoft, uh, Google, I think also Facebook, strongly prefer engineering. Like if, if you don't have this computer science uh, degree, you will not get hired probably, or it's extremely hard to get hired. And that's, but what they want is not pure engineers, they want engineers that are very user-centric, with empathy for the customers, and have business smarts, and understand a little bit of design, and can also work with people and have good communication skills and have all of this. It's like a really hard job to fill. Yeah. Uh, in Google, we interviewed a lot, a lot of people before we made a single hire. It's a, it's a very tough job to, to really find someone. So uh, back to your point, if you find someone in your team that has this naturally and you can see the tendency, they're very interested in the customers, etc., that's great. You can let them grow into the role, but sometimes you need to hire someone from, from the outside, someone who really is like this, and you need to interview a lot of people. It's, mm. it's not uh, very easy. And credentials, like experience as product manager, don't necessarily mean much. I'm a bit hesitant about the CTO being the product manager, to be honest, because uh, the CTO is really needs to spend most of their cycles about how to launch the product right, how to do the software, to design it, to make sure quality is there, while the product manager needs to think how to do the right product. And it sometimes conflicts, sometimes you just push back, and then the CTO, like the, the person wearing these two hats, needs to be really a special person to be able to completely be... What do you think, what do you think Jordi, about this? I, I totally agree. <clears throat> I think it's, in this case, we're talking about the founder. So there has to be a very special uh, person yeah. by definition, right? Yeah. So Founders. it needs to care about business, <laughs> product, people, team, and hiring, everything, and so on. Special, yeah. um, but I, <clears throat> I, ag I agree. I have a question for you. Both. Who should a product manager report to in a very small startup? In a very small startup? I think one of the founders, like either the CTO or the CEO. So you should report to the CTO. That's what I was going for. <laughs> oh, but not to the head of business, because that's usually not a good mix. Yeah, but for, if you, yeah, for me, for me, the CEO, especially in our case as a as a software company, then it it's enough important to have this input from from direct uh, to our my product manager. So the thing is that uh, your definition about the product manager it was a unicorn finally because it's quite complicated to find these kind of profiles, no? Um, but the thing is, for example, in our case, I uh, I do agree that I would like to to have a, a product manager who has uh, a computer science background. Why? Basically, because I, I think it's it's in my case it's my lack. I mean, I'm not an engineer, so I've got this lack. So I would like to strengthen uh, that part with someone who has this skill. But this is, uh, in my case, is 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 it's it's what I'm I would like to look for, no. Um, but on the other way around, um, one of the things that we have done here in Kipu is basically to to empower each person on that team. So the thing is that uh, I need someone who leads technology, which is in that case the CTO. I need someone who can help uh, with the customers and understanding. Uh, and this is people that is on support team. So and and and, and uh, my goal was always to to set up uh, appropriate communication flows so that everyone is aware of what's going on and, and finally I'm the one who 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 delivers all this information to to the whole team. Um, somehow it has relation to to promote someone from someone from within because basically what we are doing is to empower uh, each one of the team and and, and and I'm the one who finally gets that information and translates it into the people. So uh, in our case it. it Somehow we are promoting uh, my, my, my team into this product manager role, although none of them are product manager by definition. But that's why, for example, in, in probably our, 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 and for example, our product designer, it's, uh, the situation is similar to, to what Jordi has in Factorial, mm -hmm. uh, it's also the one who leads with design. Um, and, I, and I was looking for someone who, 
who, who can take this challenge. If not, it makes no sense for me in a, in a small startup, although we are just 14 people. I, I, cannot, I cannot expect that I lead with everything what's going on into, into the company, I have to empower them. But that, by definition, for me, I think the, the product manager should have uh, computers, uh, uh, software uh, skills, uh, engineering skills, basically because it's uh, one of the main competitive advantages I would have in the, in the future. So that's why I would like to, to strengthen this, this part. Hmm. Do you think he needs to be able to program, or he or she, or? Uh, I mean, for me, he who should be able to uh, this product manager should be able to do that. One thing is to to have program skills. The other thing is is to implement it because I think the development team is the one who finally will implement whatever it is. But he would be able to 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 create at least a prototype uh, and, and 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 spend some time with risky technologies. And and, and for me. The, the, for me, what I'm looking for is someone who is able to spend that time on, 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 on trying to develop things that, that are not that obvious to develop, so that before it, it turns out to be a, a task into a sprint with their specs and everything, that guy should be able to, to prototype it, to try it out, see if it makes sense, and then when it's validated, then, okay, he, uh, then it's the CTO part, no, where he has to, 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 to deliver this, this, this final product with all the specs necessary etc. So uh, on the same token maybe this person needs to be able to design as well or maybe he needs to he or she needs to do spreadsheets or business plans yeah or uh, mm -hmm. do sales calls run analytics talk mm -hmm. to customers I agree that's mm -hmm. that's a problem like I think uh, I've always seen product managers go in one of these areas more so maybe some some people go in back into the cave and then they do a prototype mm -hmm. but then they didn't do enough market research they didn't talk enough to customers mm -hmm. they didn't make it usable so it's that's one point but if you forget mm -hmm. the other four then you're kind of yeah definitely. incomplete it's the challenge I think it varies if if what you're developing is an API and your customers are developers mm -hmm. Having a PM that can program is a huge advantage. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely because that makes it so much easier for that person to to identify with the users. If what you need is someone to talk intelligently with the engineering team mm -hmm. about technical terms, then you need someone with a technical background or technical aptitude that can read, that mm -hmm. can learn, doesn't necessarily need to be able to code or understand all the intricacies mm -hmm. of the coding. Mm -hmm. Definitely architecture is good, looking at like a box diagram of your system <laughs> and not fainting is, is, is a good thing. Right. Uh, but that person needs to be able to talk to sales also and, mm -hmm. and talk to marketing and uh, think about retention, do all these mm -hmm. other things. So I wouldn't look just for someone who is a coder, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. my message. Yeah, it seems to me that the soft skills are, are super, super important, especially dealing with uh, you know, a development team with a lot of different personalities. Uh, and that, that's you know, a topic by itself. I mean, how to deal with, with an engineering team or a design team or a business team. I mean, it, you're dealing with so many different personalities. Uh, how do you do it? I mean, Jody, you have been uh, you know, dealing with the product and have been talking with different departments. You've been in sales, talking with customers, uh, developing. I mean, how do you do this? Well, the soft skills, it's, I don't know how to describe where they come from, but yeah. um, I think that's one of the things you need to look for this role, the first, like, mm. if you have somebody who's a genius, but they cannot defend their ideas in front of customers, or they cannot convince a stubborn engineer right. that this is really a priority, and this right. is really what they should be focusing, uh, focusing on before, mm. say, a refactor or mm. a technology change or something like that. Mm. Um, or is not able to deal with an angry customer that mm. found an issue with a product and you need to figure out what the issue is mm. by asking the right questions and so on, then it's, you know, all the talent behind that mm. is, is useless. So I just think like the, I don't really know how to answer your question, but <laughs> the first thing you should look for is, is this ability to negotiate, right. to listen, to carefully build a relationship with everybody, yeah. with, you know, with yeah. super hardcore nerdy developers yeah. mm. and with very pissed uh, strong mm. executives mm. or customers mm. so like you know and all at the same level right um, but for me this is by definition what I should uh, a good manager should be I mean they have to and there's different roles because uh, someone who is a head of sales their roles are totally different from a CTO or a product manager but by definition as a manager uh, 
you should be able to, yeah. to negotiate, to, to communicate, to have an analytical view. And, and there are some skills that for me are the same in each management position. And then, okay, we can go into detail of, of a given position, what are the strengths that they yeah. should be, but there are some th this kind of soft skill. Mm -hmm. For me, by definition, every manager should should yeah. have it, and especially and especially in a startup where communication is much more important, mm -hmm. cultural field mm -hmm. it's important, mm -hmm. uh, and this kind of stuff uh, for me makes uh, a must have. Uh, and then it comes the position, no? But but this kind of skills, it's it's definitely exactly. And and Itamar, I mean, you've been working as you said uh, with uh, different products such as Gmail and YouTube, as we know. I mean, uh, for you, uh, I mean, this is this is experience that not many product managers has. I mean, just let's face it. Uh, uh, from from your experience, can you give us some insight? In uh, I mean, what was your biggest challenges? You know, uh, running these teams. Uh, the same challenges that these guys are facing. Actually, mm -hmm. it's the people challenges that are usually. Uh, that's actually one of my biggest uh, favorite question when I interview in uh, PMs. It's like, what's the biggest challenges you faced? And they usually name two classes of uh, challenges. One is f understanding the customers and coming up with the right product, the right ideas to help these p uh, people, which is an objective challenge. And the other one is internally getting everyone on the same page, uh, convincing or being convinced and moving everyone, pulling in the same direction. And in Google, it's, it's a very good company. It's full of super smart people, much smarter than me, and very positive, very helpful. But the same kind of vectors exist. The engineering is pulling in this direction, business is pulling in that direction, marketing would like these features to be added. Uh, and plus we have a lot more exposure even if we change a few right. pixels someone will hate it someone will the shade of it. blue right mm -hmm. exactly <laughs> uh, so uh, so we need to be much a bit more cautious and test things a bit uh, more hmm. just to go back to your question right. about soft skills super important hmm. uh, much more important than a lot of other things that people think um, and I really like the answer I heard here, which is about relationships. That's the best way to convince people, to get into a good relationship with them, a, a partnership, where basically you understand what they're about, what they are to achieve, what they're optimizing for, and you can tell them, here's how I'm going to help you get to that point. In the end, it's not about uh, being an engineer, it's about being a, a manager, no? uh, which is the most important thing. And how do you evaluate this? these skills or how you filter candidates, you know, which is the, the process. That's first, before I answer this, uh, just to mm -hmm. make engineers feel a little, the, the engineers that are watching this feel a little bit work better. Some of the best product ideas I ever delivered came from engineering. Mm -hmm. well, we're, you're an engineer, I'm an engineer, so like, they're represented here. Yeah. They're, <laughs> not, they're not, not nothing <laughs> there. No, no, I'm not. So like, well, <laughs> but, this, there is, you know, no, but, but not from this engineer. Like, I put together a, a spec and I worked mm. with a designer and we came up and then the engineer that needed to implement this came to me and said, actually, I think there's a better way to do this. Hmm. And a natural reaction is like, oh, yeah, I'm the product manager. Who are you to tell me, actually? <laughs> uh, I'm the expert. But actually, if you listen, you find the engineers have great ideas and salespeople have great ideas. Everyone can come up with a great idea and you need to be actually more humble to accept those. Um, the trick for interviewing people that I can give is try to give them in the interview a uh, product management design uh, question. Mm -hmm. So, for example, find a market niche, like mm -hmm. people over 65 and older and find a product and say, design toaster for elderly people or design toaster for blind people. Mm -hmm. Or any of these where you force them a little bit into mm -hmm. thinking about the user, thinking about product, thinking about how they will deliver this. Mm -hmm. Within 15 minutes, you can learn a lot about their creativity, their mm -hmm. customer empathy. Mm -hmm. And the two things to look for are engineers, like hardcore engineers, will jump to the bit level and they'll mm -hmm. say, oh, I can do this and then I'll install this system and, this, uh, and uh, the communication will go with this protocol, great, not to PM. Or if you see an uh, MBA type, uh, sorry MBAs, so this, this great <laughs> product managers that are MBAs, you, it comes that oh this is how we penetrate the market and this is our competitive advantage etc it's all high level and you never get any product mm -hmm. details from them also not good. Hmm. I mean uh, we're talking about a lot, a lot about 
analyzing the market, talking with customers, and this is a big job in in a product manager role to understand you know your customers and your clients. Uh, but sometimes, especially in 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 the beginning uh, of of a company, uh, you don't know you know the full market, you don't know the potential. Uh, and I'm just a bit curious, and I think other people are curious as, as well. I mean, uh, you guys at Factorial, you're you're quite fresh. Uh, I mean, six months plus, and and. How many times do you make product decisions based on your gut, and how many times do you do it based on analytics? Honestly, or <laughs> <laughs> who's listening now? Um, I mean, I think we need to. So I, I don't think we have a lot of uh, gut decisions, mm. and if we do, the first thing we do is we run out of the office and go talk to a handful of customers at least mm. and try to be very objective and very honest with ourselves like never tell only ask and make sure their answers are aligned with what we thought or mm. what we guessed um, being very honest at our stage it's very hard to run an, a metrics driven or analytics driven business because mm. the 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 base of metrics we have the, the corpus exactly. of data is so small uh, that it doesn't really you know, allow us to optimize for things and so on. We can look at the analytics in the universe, in the market, which are useful, but they're not detailed enough for us to, to take decision, uh, specific decisions. So we have to kind of combine both. Oh, that's good How we solve it is, is uh, qualitative data. We, we do a lot of talking to customers. That's one thing that for me is a mantra, is whenever we don't know something, it's like, everybody shut up right now, who talked to a customer here? Like, you know, should, should we do this feature or this other one? And then everybody has an opinion. But then it's clear when they don't really know what has to be done. It's like, who talked to a customer recently? Mm -hmm. Okay, nobody, then let's stop this meeting. Let's all go talk to customers and then let's have this meeting again. Right. And it's not a ton of metrics, but it's something. Hmm. And I'm also curious, I mean, uh, you're super fresh, but you worked in a super established company where, I mean, you said that a small, small decision can, you know, generate a million haters around the world. Uh, did you ever do went to go with your gut as well? I mean, you have maybe one of the biggest data pools in the world, you know, to base your products on. But yeah. uh, with a lot of brilliant people, I can imagine people have these amazing ideas. You know, what's the next thing at Google? This you got to build this. Uh, what do you think? Well, there's a lot of pressure also on Google to come up with the next big thing, and internally, that's something that Google really w wants to do, always invent the future. Uh, just to balance this, I was in small startups as well in the past, so I was sitting in you guys' uh, position. Right. Um, I think even if you have a product like Gmail, where you have a ton of data, established users, has been around since 2004, when you do this next kind of more revolutionary feature, you're still peering into the abyss. You don't really know what's going to happen in the future. And uh, sometimes your prediction is as good as mine. The experts, the people that have been working on this for years, sometimes they don't know, really. We may think we know, and there's a lot of psychological mechanism that to convince mm -hmm. us that we know, we remember only our right decisions. Sometimes we even mm -hmm. subconsciously change our memory and we remember that we chose the right decision even when we chose the wrong one. There's a lot of mechanisms that this mm -hmm. uh, genius uh, entrepreneur, genius uh, inventor uh, mm -hmm. phenomena where we attribute to other people ability to peer into the future, the visioner, doesn't really, I think it's, <coughs> It's not really a thing. It's like some people are very lucky and very good at building teams around them, very good at building process to, mm. to invent the future. Right. But it's not just their vision. So um, I think the industry in general in the past five, six, ten years is starting to move away from this opinion-based, intuition-based mm. development into more um, hypothesis, <coughs> testing-based. Mm. And I think the question you always have to ask yourself is like, I have a good idea. That's intuition is super important. We should not uh, mm -hmm. throw it away. I have something that I really think is a good idea. What's the minimal test I can invent now to start validating it? Yeah. And am I, when I look at the results of the tests, are they going to be conclusive enough that I can convince myself and others that this is either a good idea or a bad idea? doesn't need to be a full conviction, it just needs to take you to mm. the next step. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's hard, even in Google, sometimes to convince people. Sometimes people mm -hmm. come from the top and say, wow, this is the future, IoT, this is going to change everything. Yeah. And they go, it's very hard to fight a wave. Yeah. Uh, but with this kind of methodological... Did you say wave? 
Was this a pun there or? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Was it you? <laughs> it wasn't me. I met some of the people and they were very small and very capable people and maybe they were a bit ahead of their time. Hmm. Uh, so, so it's hard to kind of come, but if you have data, mm -hmm. everyone, even the most opinionated manager will shut up and say, okay, you're right. <laughs> so, so right. really important. Okay, in our case, what we always did is first uh, sell and then produce. So uh, for, for, especially for the more obvious things, uh, what we always did in, in Kipu was to first uh, translate our, our idea of our product idea or feature idea, whatever it is, to the market, see if they will buy it or not. And then and then produce it. No. Now with the time that we have more data, we know more knowledge about our customers. We always um, um, this information we 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 just um, uh, I don't know, we gather it through support. And and one of the things that uh, our support team uh, support for me is not about. Uh, Solving incidences or issues. It's about uh, talking to the customer, understanding their needs. So that's why uh, one of the must, uh, the things that we always have is, is that support team should uh, should listen to the customer, and then it's our job to translate it into the product. No, and and then um, with something it has to be aligned with our vision. Then if, if it's not, and we don't do it because we can do thousands of features, but if in our case, if it's not in order to automatize administrative processes, then we don't do it. That's mm. that's the idea. And 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 in the past, we took a lot of decisions uh, that were not wrong, not completely wrong, but there were the results are were not are, wasn't as as good as we expect. But we had an, a, a valid a first validation exercise. Then the thing is that it was not the the right market fit or not the uh, the optimal market fit. Well, it's all right. I mean, we and we learn from that, and, and we learn to take less uh, schizophrenic decisions. No, but this is a part of the process. We, we, it's difficult, especially in, a, in an early stage uh, startup, to have full picture and information, especially because uh, you don't have enough customers probably to validate, uh, and, and it's not that simple. No, and, right. it, uh, and then it starts to be easier when you've got more customers. You, you, you uh, but but. But it's about intuition for me as well, no? Because in the end, we are trying to, to to produce things that are more obvious that people ask for it. But but I'm more interested on 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 solving a problem which is not that obvious and building a technology or a product that is not that obvious. And this is you won't get that word for the customer, no? That's why we try to explain to them our our idea, our vision, and then see if we, if, if we can we can make it or not, no? Right. So uh, very interesting, but we have to come to an end. Uh, so before we uh, before we end, uh, I want to take a last round and ask each one of you if you were to manage a product that's not your own tomorrow, a company, a product that you know. What what kind of product would you would you love to manage? Would you be interesting to manage? Uh, so we can start with you, Jordi. I was hoping you didn't start with me. I have no <laughs> idea. Um, I'd say I'm, I'm so deep inside the product I am right now. That's a good sign. That's a good sign. Yeah, yeah. You can't it's, think it's of any other to, product than your own. It's hard to step out. Um, I think anything that has a big transformation, like a big impact in how uh, businesses operate, is something that I'm really into. So you know, I've been working on this since different <laughs> angles in the past, but it's very interesting to look at a company with ten or ten thousand employees and then kind of change how they work through a product, right? And this product can be services, can be technology, can be software, mobile apps, whatever. Um, definitely one that gives me the opportunity to impact more businesses uh, would be something very interesting to work on. Mm -hmm. Do you have something specific? Not so specific, but it's, uh, it's kind of like much more ambitious. Uh, there's a theory that uh, every few years, every generation, and it shortens, there's a new medium that mm -hmm. kind of subsumes the old medium and uh, changes it and antagonizes the older, old generation and changes everything. I'll give an example. In the past, we would tell stories to each other in, uh, around the campfire, but then books came and started putting the stories into books. And then uh, movies came and started putting books into movies. And then TV started putting movies into TV. And then the internet came and started putting TV. And each one of these waves and the web, etc. So... Finding the next wave 
of the next medium that will subsume the web and YouTube and everything, antagonize all the existing established tech companies and uh, uh, content companies, and will change everything. That for me is exciting. I don't know how to, what it is, <laughs> but I'm willing to start exploring. All right, all right. Interesting answer. Not very specific still. Let's move <laughs> on to, to Roger. No, for me to work, uh, it's quite similar to what Jordi says. No, uh, for me because I'm working for comp uh, as a, in a B2B business, and I really enjoy much more B2B than B2C because I think it's uh, they have a stronger impact on on on, on society for me. I would love to 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 deal with a product that helps to take uh, better decisions, no? And basically, what we know that nowadays we've got a lot of data available, too much data. It's it's what happens to us. Eh? Sometimes we pro we generate more data than we are able in our company to 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 analyze and understand and to take the right decisions. Everyone knows the theory, no? Okay, you have to look at data and then take decisions. Yeah, but this takes a lot of time. Sometimes it takes so much time that then you you come up with an intuition and with. Uh, so for me, it makes sense to to create a, a software who helps dealing with with this uh, huge amount of data. And for me, it's it's not about big data issues. It, it's it's more about things more practical. I, I, I would love to open my computer and and see a, a bunch of data that helps uh, me as a CEO or other positions, a salesman or whatever, you no, know, in order to take decisions. So for me, probably will be a a, a company that deals with that. Right, right. So uh, we need to finish. Thank you so much for coming, both uh, Roger Lubano, uh, Itamar, uh, uh, Gilead, and uh, Jordi Romero. Uh, my name is uh, Sindre Hopan. Uh, I'm the media manager at ITNIC. Uh, every month we have this podcast, so uh, please uh, feel free to subscribe to our, our channel. And also you'll find the video of the podcast on our YouTube channel.